You're listening to Affected by Altitude, a Colorado Rockies podcast for and by Rockies fans on Rocky Mountain Rooftop. Thank you for joining us as we discuss all things baseball and Colorado Rockies. Hello and welcome to Affected by Altitude, the Colorado Rockies podcast on Rocky Mountain Rooftop, the Rockies affiliate of the Fans First Sports Network. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I'm your host, Evan Lang, and with me, as always, is Skylar Timmons. Skylar, how you doing? You have a good Thanksgiving? <laughs> Skylar has been replaced with an enraged turkey. <laughs> so uh, we'll see what that does for the chemistry of the show. <clears throat> Hello. This is it like an anamorph situation? Uh, Yes. Those books were weird. <laughs> I can't say I've ever really read any of them. Like, Neither honestly, I. I only ever laughed at the uh, the goofy, like, mid-transition cover art. <laughs> yeah. Where they're, like, halfway between a person and a goldfish. Yeah. There's, there's somebody on Twitter once that did, like, a... They did just a quick thread of the plot lines from every book. And it's some weird, wacky stuff happening in those books. That was a lot of young adult novels back in the day. Yeah. I, I feel like they've gotten less weird over time. <laughs> Somewhat. I remember when I remember the Animorphs TV show. I don't remember there even being an Animorphs TV show. Yeah, I think it was on Nickelodeon. It's kind of in that vein of like the old Goosebumps show. I did like the old Goosebumps show. And so I just remember I went and I checked out the new Goosebump show on Disney Plus and immediately turned it off when I found <laughs> out that the intro theme was not a remix of the original theme from the 90s Goosebump show. I turned it off about a half an hour in thinking this is boring and then stopped. <laughs> I turned it off just going, wow, that's not very good. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Rita, beware. You're in for a scare. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't read Goosebumps a lot growing up. I think my brothers did a little bit. And uh, if you haven't told folks where this is what this first segment's going to be, <laughs> we're just kind of shooting the breeze here after Thanksgiving. But I remember I didn't read the books growing up, but we did have like Goosebumps bed sheets. Those like early 2000s Goosebump bed sheets are purple and they've got characters on them. And Slappy the doll is still the most terrifying thing of my existence. I do not like that ventriloquist dummy. I do <laughs> I not like any dummies or dolls in general. Does anybody like ventriloquist dummies or just like do blatantly creepy? Uh, I was more of a are you afraid of the dark? Mm -hmm. uh person never watched it the the midnight society mm. uh yeah. they're oh man you know we're awesome do you remember the uh real scary stories to tell in the dark books yes i do that all just had like absolutely horrifying art yeah just weird chicken scratch weird drawings they're still i think they're still creepy and then they made a movie i didn't know that they made a movie. Yeah, it came out like a couple years ago. From what I heard, not bad. This uh, goes to show how you know caught up I am on the pop culture zeitgeist over the last few years. <laughs> I'm not even I'm caught up on my like current shows. I still haven't watched Loki season two. <gasps> uh, I didn't finish Ashoka. <gasps> I'm going to be real. I'm a little burned out on Marvel. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just, it's been too much. Like, it's been one of those things where it's such a constant deluge of content that it never really has any time to breathe. And I think I just, after years and years of that being the norm, I, I finally just burned out on it. Also, increased content means decreasing quality. But they're working on fixing that, hopefully. So, I mean, just take like a break, just be like for a year, like, okay, no Marvel stuff for a year, let everybody breathe. Here's some other stuff. That's that's what they did in like 
2020 covid or, doesn't count but the, the yeah <laughs> cuz it was a black widow and then it was a big gap uh, but they were still like releasing that. stuff on disney plus it's just like i oh, know it was after end game and then there was spider man and then they didn't have anything until one division in january of 2020 and WandaVision was good. I liked WandaVision. It was all downhill from there. Uh, Loki season two is pretty good, though. I, I've heard that it's great. Loki season one, really, really good. Like, the more interesting stuff that they do has been great. And so I really... It's nice to hear that they're not going to do, like, multiple more seasons. Like, Andor is going to be done after two. Loki's done after two. That we know of. Let's just... Let's just leave it. It's like, man, Andor season one, really good. Really excited for Andor season two. Just uh, don't get attached to that Andor character. Just don't uh, get attached. No, everything goes great when they get those uh, Death Star plans. I'm sure he lives a long, happy life. You know, it's pretty great. Not a single Bothan died to get us this information. It's true. That, that we need a rogue two where it's the Bothan spies getting the plans for the second Death Star. Aren't Bothans like dog people? I have no idea. They've never really addressed those people. <laughs> that dog race, people. that species of alien. Bothan. What the heck are Bothans? <laughs> yeah, they're like dog men. Hmm. Furry mammalian anthropoids about 1.5 meters tall hailing from Bathawi and several colonies <laughs> Bathawi Bathawi I don't know B O T H A W U I Bothans differed in facial appearance and body structure with canine feline and equine features they were known for being master politicians and spies craving intrigue and subterfuge <laughs> <laughs> it's the days of I like the days of George Lucas just making up weird names for everything or just like trying to mash things together yeah like there was always I'm trying to remember what it was a game that was in development and he grabs like Darth Maul and then another character that's from a completely different era and goes oh they're friends uh, for I think it was for Force Unleashed he wanted to call no Star Killer. Yeah, he wanted to call him Darth, Darth Icky. Icky. <laughs> like uh, George, no. Why not? I think it'd be pretty good. It's like uh, it's, every scene is so dense. <laughs> it's like poetry; they rhyme. But speaking of uh, the subterfuge and intrigue that the Bothans crave, uh. <laughs> We should probably talk about baseball eight minutes in. What do you think about Shohei Otani? Um, interesting news coming out of Shohei Otani that uh, he would be holding most meetings in teams in secret. And then if team, if information leaked that he was meeting with that team, they would be out of the running. So the Rockies are still in it unless the sabermetric skeptic Kevin on Twitter ruined that with an email. <laughs> sent from my iPad. Yeah. I don't know. Shohei Otani is tricky because there are lots of places he could end up. I think for sure the one place we know he's not going to be is the Angels. Yeah. But I don't know. I just, I really don't want him to be a Dodger. Yeah. The, the, and that's what I hate with a lot of the just like off season stuff is all the rumors like media every prediction comes down to the same number of teams it's always the dodgers it's always the yankees no it's always those big top payroll teams the more notable teams oh shohei wants to go he's gonna go be a dodger they are the ones who are gonna go get him and so they hear that stuff and their beliefs and then it the rest of a lot of the, the gms and office people and media people just focus on that no, they set up the storyline, and then they're disappointed when that's not the storyline. Yeah, type of thing, and so that gets kind of annoying because 
no, Shohei wouldn't do it, but man, somebody should have, instead of the Golden Bachelor, like give us the Bachelor, but it's on MLB Network even, but it's Shohei Otani courting these other teams. And then I don't know, I think that would actually be really compelling content of just watching Mm -hmm. and seeing, like put a camera with the player who's going through and having all of these meetings with with various teams, see how each team Mm -hmm. sort of conducts themselves, who does the interviews, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the yeah. one the one team that keeps popping up for Otani is the Braves, interestingly enough, which is I think they finally reached that point in terms of exposure that they're now considered one of those big teams. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> they can't look around the league and, OK, who can we trade and then immediately sign to a extended contract as the cat precariously climbs over your PlayStation five in the background. I'm trying really hard not to laugh (laughs) as I'm watching in my own camera feed of my cat, just very precariously is, is the good word for it. Like climbing up on top of my PS (laughs) five. Clip it for the social medias, but it's it's exactly like Shohei. He's just kind of treading carefully over everything. Because there's a lot of these teams that are they're the big teams. And of course, everybody assuming, yeah, he's going to get a, a gigantic contract, record-breaking contract, because you're basically buying two players. But I think the big thing, because I feel like Shohei's different than a lot of other you know, U.S. free agents or a lot of other free agents where I don't, part of me feels like the, <laughs> part of me feels like money isn't, the big driving factor for him. Whereas, no, that's it. You'll never, I don't think we'll ever see anybody that just eat, sleeps, and breathes baseball as much as Shohei Otani does. Because you can look at his history of in Japan growing up and what his regimen was and the training schedule and everything. And so, I, more so winning, I think, is what he wants, is what team is set up to win now and sustain success of winning. And so that's that's the intriguing part of if you any team can come up with a plan like okay this is what we're gonna do to win this is where we're at right now puts them in a lot better spot than saying oh we just have the biggest pockets here you go so you're saying the Rockies are out uh yes <laughs> that would be man just having a year of Shohei as the DH crushing dingers one year seventy million dollars. Yeah, and he's going to, like, I I do agree that a big part of how Shohei seems to operate is that he does really eat, sleep, and breathe baseball. But, you know, don't get us wrong on that. He's going to get paid. Mm -hmm. He's not going to turn down a huge contract. I don't think anybody would. But it's more interesting for him to be looking at where there's going to be a long-term chance of success. Um or potentially where he's going to be really embraced by the fan base. Frankly, I think the Seattle Mariners would be a really fun spot for Shohei. Staying in division is a fun storyline. They did just do uh, some payroll dumping in trading Eugenio Suarez, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But, you know, that's a that's a team that's already very popular in Japan because of uh, players like Ichiro and... Mm-hmm. Having and and Ichiro still uh, coaching with that team, he's a he's still a dug, uh, a dugout and clubhouse presence, despite the fact that he's no longer playing. And instead, at the age of fifty, going and pitching complete game shutouts against a uh, Japanese high school girls team. I know. <laughs> uh, we may not get Shohei Otani, but can we get Ichiro out of retirement to come pitch for the Rockies? Mm? A I new mean- Jamie Moyer. Who can actually throw hard? You know, 86. Is that hard? It's harder than Jimmy Moyer. (laughs) Oh, Jimmy Moyer. But yeah, it's Shohei's thing is just interesting because because then you get reports of the Dodgers would want to both sign him and then trade for Mike Trout. And uh, it's just unfair sometimes just looking around the league and what other teams have that capacity to do. And then you get the mid market teams are like, yeah, we're already out. So we got to do this other stuff, which it's just the disproportionateness of baseball and like payrolls and everything does kind of get annoying. 
Yeah. I would say there would be nothing worse for the sport of baseball than for the Dodgers to get both Otani and Trout. Yeah, because it's not as if they already have a bunch of other MVPs on their team. Mookie and Betts, Freddie Warriors. Freeman, Clayton Kershaw. Ugh. Though we don't know if Kershaw is going to be back. Kershaw is still technically a free agent, but it's it's pretty much it pretty much does appear that you know Kershaw is going to be a Dodger until he retires. Mm-hmm. And but... you know people are reading a lot into Kershaw's performance in the playoffs, where you know he did really struggle, but you know he was not healthy. He was very clearly not healthy mm-hmm. during those playoffs. Yeah. And the thing with Shohei too, it's this is the tough one. He we know he wants to do both. He can't do both in 2025 because he's whatever his elbow surgery was that they're keeping top secret of what it was. But that he can't do it in 2025. So you're just getting a DH for next year. But it's how long can he keep pitching and being an effective pitcher? Because at some point during whatever contract he signs, if it's a long term one he'll have to give up pitching at some point or be like in a limited reliever role, maybe because at some point it's going to catch up to him. My guess, he's going to try and continue to be both a starter and a DH for as long as he possibly can. Mm -hmm. My guess is that in a few years, he might ease himself into a relief role. So he's not being just, Const the not getting as heavy as a workload where he's not going out and weekly being expected to, you know, pitch six, seven innings. Instead, he's going to pitch like one or two innings a week. But honestly, I think that's a little bit further down the road, knowing what we do about Shohei Otani and just how much he cares about what he does. Uh, they will have to take starting pitching duties away from him kicking and screaming before yeah. that ever happens. And that, that's what's going to make structuring that contract whatever for the average annual value because if people are predicting oh he's going to get like 50 million dollars a year which I, honestly no player should be getting paid th- that incredible money <laughs> that's so much money they're already getting paid a ton those top players but it's that's a lot to contribute to one guy who can at some point something happens to his arm where he can't pitch anymore no he develops blood clots in his arm it, something weird some freaky accident to that pitching arm that's already undergone Tommy John surgery. Now this other elbow surgery, this UCL maybe strain tear, whatever. Shoulder problems may pop up. So it's how do you structure that to account for at at any point? He might not be able to pitch anymore, but he can still hit. Yeah, well, or vice versa. Is- that's why his contract is expected to be so massive because you are essentially, it's like in fantasy baseball, you are paying for two players. You are paying for Shohei Otani, the DH, and you are paying for Shohei Otani, the pitcher, where he's one of the best at what he, best of what he does in both of those fields. Mm-hmm. So like, say you're paying 250 million for the DH and 250 million for the pitcher. Mm-hmm. Now, that was the one of the one I saw of how to structure it maybe is, no, say he goes up into that Max Scherzer territory, oh, forty-five million dollars, but or even just like a forty, and then you have a bunch of pitching incentives added in there that then you no know, ratchet up things to where it does give him that big contract. So yeah, you have the big maybe like three hundred or even four hundred million dollar contract, but yeah. then there's all this. There's more pitching. It's more weighted on the on the the batting side, but the pitching stuff is those escalators are in there that really bump it up. Something like that. I don't envy whoever the accountants and people who are having to, to kind of structure and figure out how to structure that contract. Well, they'll figure it out eventually. Yes. But again, yeah, we should have had a reality TV show about this. I'd watch it. We can put the golden bachelor on TV we can put Shohei Otani's The Decision. I mean, there's so many different like baseball TV shows you could do. You could do a hard knock style of oh, baseball during like spring would. training because that's really compelling content. We've already seen with the Rockies with the club of when they're doing spring training stuff. It's really interesting to watch. I uh, I really liked when 
you know, early on in the season, they were doing stuff where like Ryan McMahon was down in Arizona, you know, joined by like Nolan Jones and joined by some of the other guys. That's really interesting content. So for people who like eat, sleep, breathe baseball, that's stuff that they're going to watch. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this team, this league has a, has trouble marketing, it, marketing itself. Yeah. And, and when you, the thing you mentioned earlier, like watching those interviews and like how it would, those meetings Shohei is having, like, I don't think MLB wants to be that transparent. They'd never let themselves be that, tra- especially the owners would never let themselves be oh, that transparent. That's for sure. Like, I, I'm sure GMs and players and all sorts of other front office people will be on board. The owners would not, not in a million years. Yeah. Ugh. But we are going to take a uh, quick break here. When we get back, we'll dive a little bit more into off-season moves. We talked about Shohei Otani, but there are other moves that are being made and moves to be made. So stick around, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Affected by Altitude with Skyler and Evan here on Rocky Mountain Rooftop. So Shohei Otani, we don't know where he's going to go, but... Other teams are making moves, and we'll go ahead and just start with Colorado Rockies making another offseason trade with the Cleveland Guardians, this time for right-handed starting pitcher Cal Quantrill, the pride of Ontario, Canada. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we talked about him a little bit you know, in past with Patrick Lyons last week, but uh, so you folks have heard my thoughts on it, but give us your thoughts on the move, Evan. Uh, honestly, I've... I wish I hadn't had to uh, had to miss last week because I really wanted to talk about this when it was still a little bit more fresh. But I really, really like the move. I think it's a incredibly low risk, high reward move where the Rockies are desperate for starting pitching, especially with Erman and Senzi um, probably not playing for the majority of, if not the majority of, or if not all of next season. So either he's going to be a guy who just eats innings and that's something that the Rockies desperately need, or he has the potential of bouncing back. So he had a bad 2023 Cal Cal Quantrill did. Uh, He was battling with shoulder injury with a shoulder injury. He had an ERA of uh, 5.24 in 19 starts and 99 and two thirds innings. Not a great season for Cal, but he has a history of being, really good his 2020 2021 and 2022 seasons were all very strong seasons eras under four making at least 20 starts um in two of those three seasons in uh, 2020 he actually worked did most of his work out of the bullpen um still finished the year with a 2.25 era but then 2021 and 2022 worked majority as a starter made 32 starts last year with cleveland still had an era of 3.38 I think that if he can be healthy and be back on track, he really does have a chance to be a strong member of a Rockies rotation that is in dire need of reinforcements. And if he's, you know, not great, then he at least is a body that we can throw to eat innings. (laughs) Either way, that's positive value from this trade um, where the Rockies traded uh, minor league catcher Cody Huff who I like Cody Huff, but he is depth that we had in this where he's a, you know, a low A catcher with the Fresno Grizzlies. And we uh, designated Tommy Doyle for assignment as part of that trade to make room on the 40 man roster. Um, That's pretty low in terms of cost for this move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, and this is some Thomas Harding wrote in a, some article where the Rockies, showing they they to get a starting pitcher it's gonna have to come via trade now they can get creative with trades and figure out a way to bring in arms and hey you can bring in a no a more established big league starter in cal quantrill for a relatively pretty low cost of a minor league catcher that was what in high a at the most so far so pretty low and you already have you're pretty set in your catcher depth at the moment. So it's a pretty simple trade and maybe they can figure out more ways that don't necessarily require the moving of a Brendan Rogers or Ryan McMahon, which we might talk about later. But I was looking at this past, my most recent rock pile at purple row was looking at the, the Jason Marquis trade 
and his 2009 season, which turned out pretty dang good <laughs> for the Rockies. And it, the trade for Cal Quantrill just is that's the kind of the, the parallel that I've been drawing between the two, where a guy getting close to 30. Now, Marquis was further along in the big leagues. He'd already been around for like 10 years, <laughs> but you no, know, had had a rough few years. And you no, know, Rockies decided a pretty low cost. We'll trade for him, bring him in to add to our rotation because one, the guy goes deep into ball games. He'll eat innings, give you at least six most of the time. And then you know, sinker baller doesn't really throw very hard. You know, so he's not going to get a ton of strikeouts, but he's effective, gets ground balls. You know, he fits the Rockies mold. Despite as much as they continue to preach that they're looking to figure out something new, get different types of pitchers. There's really one type of pitcher that they keep getting. And it's sinker ballers, guys that can get ground balls, which is fine. It's just not fine when that's your entire rotation. Yeah. But he he fits that parallel when now Quantrill can get swing and misses, can get whiffs, get chases. He's got good pitches despite not throwing very hard. Throwing very hard. I think he's what, like 92, 93 on his sinker, fastballs, average velocity, somewhere around there. But he's got a good slider, curveball, all that good stuff. So if he can you know, figure out how to harness that, he could be along the lines of a Jason Marquis. Marquis still had like a four ERA, but an incredible first half in Colorado to become an all star. He won 15 games on the year, won 11 games before the all star break. So if Cal Quantrill, that I think that's the benchmark. If he can be like Jason Marquis and find some consistency like Marquis did who changed his delivery, tweaked some things coming into that season. It, a really good trade for the Rockies at a guy who's you know, what? 6 million, maybe in arbitration is what he's going to get. Mm -hmm. So six to 7 million. And he's still under a year of control as well. So it could turn out to just be a good, uh, a low risk. Like you said, low risk trade. I know there's people on Twitter that aren't happy about that move. Like, oh, he gets hit hard. Look at all that blue on his baseball savant. But I'm always of that belief. Don't judge a pitcher simply like everything. You can gather a lot, but don't judge and make your decision entirely on what a guy did in a previous season. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, those are informed. Like, yeah, there's not some good stuff on his stats. But don't let that be the end all be all because you watch him. He was injured last year. So that's tough to deal with. He, <laughs> there was like several stinkers in his outings, but for the most part, like fairly solid when he was healthy and good to go. Yeah. And um, Rocky Central manager Bill Schmidt said he was especially looking at his end of the season where, yeah. you know, in his, his final six starts in September, he was looking a lot better um you know he went in his in his last six starts three of which uh were quality starts where he went six or more innings and only gave up uh three or less earned runs so you have you know two earned runs zero one earned run two one in his final six starts he only really had one sort of dud and it was his last start of the season mm -hmm. where he went five innings and gave up four earned runs in Detroit and he's still tallying multiple strikeouts in each game Cal Quantrill's not a strikeout guy like like Kyle Freeland as well he's going to have a low K9 but you know we'll take that kind of performance it's you know you, you were talking about with Jason Marquez oh well let's see how the four ERA a four ERA will play with the Rockies like yeah. we'll take that because you look at you know the single season ERA records and most of them are just like mid threes Mm -hmm. for the Rockies we have the you know the two where they were under under three for the full season which was Ubaldo and Kyle Freeland but pretty much every other full season ERA record is you know three four or higher and so we'll we'll take that especially when this team is is pitching needy mm -hmm. 
And I'm really hoping that we can make some more acquisitions, say Brendan Woodruff, who was uh, waived by the Milwaukee Brewers. We need arms. And this is 2024 is going to be a year where you want to take a chance on some reclamation projects and some other things and see what you can get out of those. Mm -hmm. So Brendan Woodruff wouldn't really be able to help us until the second half of 2024 and maybe 2025. I'd still take it. Um, but that's that move. We also did the, the Jalen Beeks move. Now we're just sort of sitting and waiting for, um, what else Anything. the Rockies are going to do. <laughs> it's, you know, it's the holiday weekend. Um, next week, I think week after next week is when the winter meetings start, uh, rule five draft. So we're going to see a lot more from there. There are some other moves being made throughout the league. Uh, really one of the biggest ones was the Seattle Mariners traded third baseman Eugenio Suarez to the Arizona Diamondbacks for a rookie relief pitcher and uh, a backup catcher, (laughs) a 30-year-old backup catcher in Seve Zavala. And uh, a lot of Mariners fans that I've talked to are not happy with this move. This is a team that needed more offense. And Mm -hmm. they traded one of their best offensive players. And the guy who was largely considered kind of the soul of the clubhouse there um, for not a huge return. And whereas this is a great trade for Arizona because they need a third baseman. They wanted a veteran third baseman. And they're capitalizing on their good season in order to make another push this coming year. And it's... It's really weird. The, the Mariners and the Diamondbacks trade with each other a lot in the grand scheme yeah. of things. It's like the Rockies with the Guardians, Braves, and Angels. <laughs> but it was, it makes me wonder, what the heck are the Mariners doing? Like, what is their plan? Because they're in this wonderful window of contention. They have a lot of talent. They've got the pitching. They've got some you know, good stars on their team with Julio Rodriguez and some other notable no, well, not as notable, but why aren't they putting more? Why aren't they adding to their offense instead of taking away and whatnot? Because you know, Suarez, he had a down year in 2022 or in 2023. Still 20 some on home runs. Dude's going to strike out a lot. And I think that was kind of a former Rocky Jerry DePoto, uh, the president of baseball ops over there. They're wanting to bring in more contact bats, higher contact bats. And I guess Suarez just doesn't fit into that because he's like a 250 average. But he's going to bring a lot of power and walks into your lineup. So they choose, well, we're going to maybe they go out and they're looking for somebody else to play third base. They're going to bring in a Matt Chapman or maybe they trade for something else. But uh, or Ryan McMahon is available. But well, if they're trying to get rid of strikeouts, <laughs> Ryan McMahon is yeah, not the guy. Yeah. <laughs> but no, maybe they're going to go look for somebody else. But it's it's frustrating, man. What are the Mariners doing? Because now the Diamondbacks, and I wrote about this trade over at fansforsports.com, where Suarez now adds a lot more pop. Where last season uh, they, they had, I think, four guys with 20 or more home runs just five guys in total with 10 or more home runs. But now they replace Evan Longoria uh, and whoever else they had playing third base last year. They replaced them with Suarez, who's getting paid maybe about 13 million guaranteed for next year, has a club option for 15 million next year. Well, can add 20 plus home runs, can slot in nicely there with Christian Walker. You now have some, Really good power potential at the corners in Arizona to add with a Corbin Carroll, a Cattell Marte, whoever's going to play shortstop. And so they, they've got a nice little build there. And the Diamondbacks are a team that don't strike out as much. You know, they were, I think, top four in the league or something with in strikeout percentage and lower strikeout percentage. And so Suarez is a the guy they can absorb that hit of whatever strikeouts he's going to add. Because you got other ways, other guys on the team that can get on base. Yeah, and I I do get where the Mariners are coming from, where they had a lot of strikeouts, and Eugenio Suarez led the league in strikeouts last year with 214. But he also hit 22 home runs, is a solid defensive third baseman. 
um, you know, had overall a decent season, though a, a down year by his standards, um, OPS of 0.714. But what are they also, but the Mariners also got rid of Teoscar Hernandez yeah, for the reason of strikeouts. And this is a team that needs offense that got rid of two of their better offensive players due to high strikeout totals. Yeah. And I get that it's also a salary dump in terms of the Mariners, but you know, now you better utilize that salary dump to bring in some better offensive players mm-hmm. um, once the off season kicks back into full gear, or you're going to have some really unhappy fans in Seattle. Yeah. And that's with the Mariners. It's, it's got those hints of, the 2018 Rockies, you know, in a sense where they got that team, the window is open. What are they going to do in this off season to get them over the hump? And they do nothing. Especially with their baffling move of trading uh, closer Paul Sewell at the, at the, at the deadline, deadline this yeah. year, where they were inexplicably sellers despite being in the race until pretty much the last week of the season. Yeah, and that's where like the Mariners are getting stuck where, Oh, we have this plan and what we're supposed, we're going to be doing and how we're, but it's, you got to break those plans because you're doing better than what those plans dictate. You got to go all in and yeah, make if a you're move. At the, if you're at the point where that window is open, but you still consider yourself to re- to be rebuilding, you know, the yeah. better move in my opinion is to, all right, well, we ended up in contention. Let's, let's make our push. Yeah. Like, well, okay, let's go out. Who can we bring in that's the top offensive people that can come in? Well, show, hey, well, maybe we're, because I understand they're going to be under a budget. They want us, teams are going to do that. So, Shohei's a little out of our price range. But Jorge Soler, do you want to come be our DH? No, things like that. Because if they want more offense, more pop, or somebody that can, you need all kinds of bats to make up a lineup. And, no, they need more power, some more boom in that lineup, and strikeouts are going to come with that. That's just how sluggers are. But it's uh, poor Mariners are frustrating. Yeah, well, and it's they had they had plenty of pop in the lineup last year. You know, you had two guys with thirty plus, you had uh, two more guys with twenty plus, and you had you know four or five guys who all had ten plus. But they do need some improvement in terms of on base percentage. You know, team OBP is only 321, team OPS 734. But getting rid of Eugenio Suarez, I would say, was not the move I would have made unless you have something planned where you're going to bring somebody in. Because Eugenio Suarez and Teoscar Hernandez are were two of the top 12 players by wins above replacement for that team last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's weird stuff, but if they want to, if they trying to figure out a new hitting philosophy, no, it's good. You want to bring in more high contact guys to kind of change that hitting philosophy for the club. That's good. But is it going to solve all your problems? Probably not. Yeah. So you just got to get that good mixture of, okay, we need, some more higher contact guys in these areas that can produce better. Like Ty France, yeah, you had a good year, but are you our answer ultimately at first base? Um, maybe not. Reese Hoskins, on the other hand, maybe you can come in and be our on base guy because he draws a lot of walks. So it's it's yeah. What's weird about the strikeouts and walks thing is that the Mariners had the second most strikeouts in the league, just a little bit above the Rockies with uh sixteen hundred or 1603 if you want to be picky, but they were also decently above the average for walks where they had 550 walks drawn Um, for comparison. The league leader was the San Diego Padres with 653, uh, 297 of those being Juan Soto. Mm -hmm. Um, And the Rockies are down near the bottom with 447. So the strikeouts weren't as big a deal, um, especially when, their on base percentage, even though it was low, was still above league average. Again, you compare with the Rockies, the Rockies had an on base percentage of 310 last year, or you know, the guys at the bottom of the barrel, the Oakland A's and the Chicago White Sox were in the 290s. <laughs> the but, Las Vegas A's, 
don't get me started on that because i'm gonna get <laughs> angry um but yeah interesting to see what the mariners are going to do from here but we're going to take another quick break and when we get back uh it's a magical time of year hall of fame ballots are being mailed out so stick around we'll be right back welcome back to affected by altitude the final segment of our show this week figure we'd kick things off by talking about one of what we are hoping is going to be a nice and fruitful year it's uh it's hall of fame ballot time and we are hoping this year that one mr todd helton is going to make it into the hall this year he was just above just barely barely didn't make it last year um, with some other names falling off the ballot, we are hoping that some names are going to show up. Um, we do have our first ballot of the year that just came in. Thanks, <gasps> to, Ryan, thanks to Ryan Thibodeau on social media, who uh, helps track Hall of Fame ballots. Uh, our first ballot is from Adam Rubin. Um, Adam Rubin voted for Todd Helton. So... Ooh. And Hall of Fame ballots this year, Todd Helton is one for one. But it's an interesting ballot this year. Uh, new names on the ballot. We have uh, Adrian Beltre. He's pretty much a slam dunk candidate. Uh, Matt Holliday, David Wright, Chase Utley, uh, Joe Maurer, and Brandon Phillips. Uh, and Jose Bautista. Oh, and Bartolo Colon and Adrian Gonzalez. So there's a lot of new names on the ballot this year. But I think a lot of those new names aren't necessarily going to be locks. And I think a lot of those guys are going to fall off. For example, I love Matt Holiday. I'd probably vote for him if I was given a ballot. But I am predicting Matt Holiday probably falling off the ballot this year. Yeah, or at least I feel like he's done, he did enough, especially in St. Louis, to garner at least two years on the ballot. Or something slightly because he had a good career like but it's it's tough with my thing with the hall of fame voting is stop comparing these guys to the past yeah and like compare them against their generation of baseball players and during my holidays generation during his prime between colorado and st louis one of the best sluggers and hitters in baseball Oh, did he win MVPs? No, he should have though in one year. But still, a fantastic career. You know, I feared was a backbone of those Cardinals teams in many of those years. So I think he should gather some interest from the league. Like, yeah, he probably doesn't get in, but I think more consideration should be given than immediately just kind of disregarding him immediately. Yeah, oh, because like Coors Field. Yeah, uh, two ninety nine career hitter with a five ten career slugging. I don't know. I don't know why I said it like that. Five ten career slugging percentage. Seven time All Star, four time Silver Slugger, won a batting title. Was the National League Championship Series MVP for the Rockies in two thousand seven, the same year where he finished runner up in National League MVP voting for regular season awards. When he should have won. He should have won. Um. Because, uh, yeah, Jimmy Rollins won MVP that year, and Jimmy Rollins had more runs, and that's it, mm-hmm. <laughs> and more and still stolen bases. And but overall, Matt Holiday finished that year hitting 344, 05, 607 with an OPS of 1.012. 36 home runs, 137 RBIs, led the league, led the league in batting average, led the league in hits. He was so darn good that year. And, you know, it is a bummer. If he does get in, I'm pretty sure he goes in with the Cardinals cap. Yeah. But 316 career home runs, like pretty good. For the most of his career, you know, the home run numbers were pretty solid throughout. He's always like, 20 plus home runs pretty consistent throughout his career uh, defensively yeah but <clears throat> it's just that weird thing they're gonna hold those six years in Colorado against him I yep. feel like because they've been trying the course field automatically makes you the greatest hitter there ever was which at that point why do we have a team in Colorado then 
if you're just yeah. going to disregard everything any player ever does. Any team that plays at Coors Field, even guys that come and play on the road, then take away their stats. Just disregard. Get rid of the team yeah. if they're just going to. That's what drives me crazy because everyone's like, will Todd Helton break the Coors Field curse? And it's like, I thought we did that already with Larry Walker. Yeah. It was supposed to be Probably Larry people. Walker. Larry Walker broke that perception Carter. of if you're if you play at Coors Field, you're only good because you played at Coors Field. I thought Larry Walker solved that problem, especially when Todd Helton has a better road OPS than multiple other Hall of Famers right now. No, Larry Walker, he he played other places, so we we knew what he was capable of. We don't know what Todd Helton would have been outside of Coors Field. Yeah, uh, yes hopefully, we do. <laughs> hopefully Todd Helton's in this year. Um. Yeah. Uh, really interesting name on the ballot this year is also David Wright, the longtime third baseman for the New York Mets, who really had his career and potential cut short via injury. Where it's you know, funnily enough, I think David Wright has a better chance than Matt Holiday, just because David Wright gets the luxury of having played in New York. Mm-hmm. So David Wright played just one less season than Matt Holiday, though he played a lot less games because he was hurt so much. But very similar in that he was a seven-time All-Star, just like Matt Holliday, um, two-time Silver Slugger, two-time Gold Glover, and you know, don't get me wrong that I would absolutely vote for David Wright were he on, uh, were I granted a ballot. But it's going to be really interesting to see where I really do think that David Wright has a better chance than Matt Holliday simply because he played his entire career with the New York Mets with a big market team in New, in New York city where people are just, they get more attention that way. Yeah. Uh, I'm the opposite. I don't think he is a hall of famer. You don't think David Wright's a hall of famer? No. Just when I mean, you look at the impact of his career, like it was good, but there's nothing like really flashy about it. I think thing. if they had, I think if they had won the world series, um, if he in stayed healthy, especially at the end, too. Yeah, I think I think if the Mets had won the World Series and he had stayed healthy for a little bit longer, uh, then he would be a lock. Yeah, but 242 career home runs, like he's he's got some of those counting stats a little bit. They're like on that cusp of, yeah, like maybe he could squeak in, but I don't think he he gets in. Because at the end of the day, like all star nominations don't really matter. Yeah. Because that's a fan vote. <laughs> but versus a guy who I think should be a lock is uh, Twins catcher Joe Maurer. Mm-hmm. And and I'm the same because I was, <laughs> I don't know if my brother was jokingly arguing with me about it or not. <laughs> but. I feel like he was because he's like, he doesn't have the rings. I'm like, that doesn't matter. That's a team thing. But Joe Maurer, like, when you think of his generation of catchers, like who pops up as like the top catchers of his generation? There's like Buster Posey's in there. There's Yachty. Who else? This is Joe Maurer. And one of the few catchers that have won an MVP in sort of our and generation of players. Titles. Three yeah, batting right. titles, three-time Gold Glover, five-time Silver Slugger, six-time All-Star, and that MVP. Really, when when I look at it of that sort of time frame, I really do view Joe Maurer as as very similar to Todd Helton in the regard of full career with the team. Uh, honestly, kind of underrated by I think a lot mm-hmm. of the media, and well, like a lot of catchers are because unless they're doing things like JT Romuto or Buster Posey, where well, Joe Maurer was just kind of in that lower market, mid-market. The Twins weren't paying much attention to him. But one of the great best catchers of his generation and like of the modern-day catcher, of what can a modern-day catcher do, well, it's like Joe Maurer, really good defensively, like really good defensively, and then can also contribute offensively. And yeah, he dealt with the concussions later on in, they moved him to first base. That's good. Like, put the health over the player. And he was still a contributing bat until he retired. And, oh, Minnesota kid plays for the Minnesota Twins for as long as he did. Like, yeah, dude should be a Hall of Famer. Just yeah. 
for the impact of the Hall of Fame is to preserve the history of baseball and celebrate the players of those of the generations. And so you've got to put the guy who's the only guy to appear in back to back MLB the show covers. Yeah. <laughs> for that reason alone. And that's where I think a lot of Hall of Fame voting gets hung up is they keep comparing it to the guys that played the like, game back in like the 50s yeah. and 60s. It was like, who was that 93 year old voter last year? Oh, who yeah. Submitted <laughs> a blank ballot as a protest for the modern game of baseball or something like that. And this is a dude who hasn't covered baseball in decades, 93 years old, and submitted a blank ballot basically out of spite. Yeah. Or guys like Rob Parker or Rob Park, whatever his name is, that they have to reach a benchmark 500 home runs, 3,000 hits. That type of stuff. Like he so basically these, no one should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, he's like he's got these they want the thing with baseball writers like I don't know why they feel like they're these gatekeepers that have to keep this such a little tiny hall. You look at football, they've got like three inductees of guys I've never heard of getting inducted every year. I'm like, who's this guy? No, the Broncos have a Hall of Famer like every year. And so it's, what are the baseball writers doing? Stop comparing it to yesteryear. Celebrate what the guys are doing now. Yeah. And compare it to their the era they played in. Yeah, pitchers aren't going to be getting 3,000 strikeouts anymore. No, they're not going to be logging complete games, all this stuff that they did in the past. Same with hitters. Yeah. Like it's, Nolan, hard, it's Nolan harder Ryan to hit home runs. Never, Nolan Ryan is never going to happen again. Yeah. And like you look at offensive players, do you know? Do they know how hard it is to hit nowadays, as compared to back in the day, with the with the way pitchers are now, and the way the games played, and the well, difference trying, in the ball? Some some jackass politician was saying that the velocity that everyone is throwing now is fake, and back in the days of like Bullet Bob Feller, they were actually throwing faster. <laughs> I'm, I bet that politician probably believes in some other conspiracy theories, but it's a, uh, that's the thing is look at the modern day. You want to preserve the game. Look at how it is being played now and compare how those guys are performing in that generation in that era was Joe Mauer, Johnny bench. No, but Johnny bench played back in the seventies. And and players also need to be looked at at their own Mowers. Is like was Joe Mauer Johnny Bench? No, Joe Mauer was Joe Mauer, and Johnny Bench was Johnny Bench. Todd Helton wasn't Babe Ruth. Todd Helton was Todd Helton. Mm -hmm. Like you need to be looking at the individual merits of all of these these players. Yeah, you can compare some of them. Like I talked about just earlier, Todd Helton's road OPS is better than multiple Hall of Famers, and yet he still has playing half of his games at Coors Field in his career against him. But when you put up these arbitrary blocks of like oh if you're a hitter you have to be 3500 you know, that's just seven players in the entire history of our game that's seven guys mm -hmm. yeah it's and especially with the home runs it's like not everybody's a home run hitter look at ichiro ichiro could have if he had wanted to been a home run hitter we mm -hmm. know that he has the power that he had the power to do so but he instead tailored his game towards contact hitting and became one of the greatest hitters of all time. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's like we've seen an argument against Todd Helton. Oh, he didn't hit enough home runs. As Being a first baseman, he should have had more home runs. That's not who Todd Helton was. Yeah, he was a prodigious doubles hitter. Yeah, and like, yeah, <laughs> there's. It, it feels like that a lot of them have one idea of what a hall of fame hitter is and it's got that hits for a high average has 500 home runs doesn't take steroids and stuff like that but it's uh, the voters really get annoying and i don't know how you fix the voting system or how you adjust it but it's basically up to these voters like hey the process that you go through need you need to figure something out I think, I mean, I don't proclaim to be an expert, but I think one of the things you need to do to fix the voting system is that you have to still be actively writing about baseball. Mm -hmm. 
you can't just be coasting by because you got your BBWAA membership, but you haven't written about baseball or covered the sport in 20 years. You're not in touch with the guys who are being inducted or who are up for induction. Mm -hmm. Like these are the, we're, we're at the point now, like the guys who are on the ballot are the guys that I grew up with and I'm yeah. in my thirties. Yeah. So the, these guys who are, who are way out of date and like, it's a really interesting ballot this year. I like our, ba the, the ballot a lot this year. I think there's a lot of interesting cases for, for folks to vote for. Um, I posted on my various social medias, I posted what I would consider to be my ideal ballot, um, just for this year. Um, not necessarily for every year and for all of these guys, but I, I would have chosen Bobby Abreu, Adrian Beltre. Todd Helton, Matt Holliday, Andrew Jones, Joe Maurer, Jimmy Rollins, Gary Sheffield, Billy Wagner, and David Wright. But there's lots of really interesting players on this ballot. You've got Andy Pettit, you've got A-Rod, you've got Torrey Hunter and Carlos Beltran, Bartolo Colon, Agon, Manny Ramirez. Like This is a fascinating ballot for our generation of baseball. Uh -huh. And you just know that you're going to have people submitting blank ballots because they don't think it's up to snuff with their generation. Or, yeah. you know, Derek Jeter's not on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's because you're now in the era of guys that were suspended for steroids and performance enhancers. So Manny Ramirez, Alex Rodriguez, they're off my ballot. Mm -hmm. Like I go with what uh, John Morosi said when he's like, players that were suspended after the, you know, the regulations and you know, the punishments were set in place by Major League Baseball. If they're caught after that and they're suspended, so Manny Ramirez and A-Rod, they're automatically disqualified yeah. from his ballot. Whereas That's... he voted for Barry Bonds because that was before they had yeah. the, like the, and the punishments and stuff. Everybody's going to have different opinions on the PED yeah. use in baseball. A-Rod was an incredible player, but... Yeah. Tarnished his, it because greed of money. But it tarnished with, with his PEDs and his interactions with the media and how his tenure in, with the New York Yankees went as well. Um, and he's, I think, he's been very lucky that he's been given more of a chance to rehabilitate his image than some of the other PED users. Um, because, no, this was, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago where he was complaining that the Yankees hadn't retired his number. Yeah. And oh, I'm just thinking, it's like, you are so lucky, A-Rod, that you are getting this chance to be on the broadcast and rehabilitate your image yeah. because your tenure with the Yankees was a tough one for the fans. Do, is anybody like really glad like him on those broadcasts though? No, I think he's terrible. <laughs> I think. And then he's like really, really orange. Like what's really funny is color. Derek Jeter during the playoffs was great. His, he had a really good natural chemistry with David Ortiz. Mm -hmm. And then you had a rod there and I'm like, hey, go away. Let me, let me listen more to, uh, to Jeets and Poppy. But no, oh, man, yeah, some... it's complicated. See, I, I had bonds on, if I had a ballot, I would have voted for bonds because before he used PEDs, he was still one of the best hitters in the history of the game. But you have to consider the entire career. That's the thing for everybody. You got to yep. consider their entire career. And I'm partly in the camp where, Carlos Beltran can be on my ballot because it was the 2017 season. Yeah, he was an idiot and helping that whole team cheat. So we can just take away that one season. <laughs> ah, I see. So uh, you have to take into yes. account the whole career unless <laughs> you're Skyler. Hey, dang straight. Double standards, <laughs> baby. <laughs> but uh, no, Adrian, it, I think they, it wasn't as, his thing isn't as severe as like the consistent year over year use. Like, yeah, it was pretty stupid that, but he, but the punishments came after his career and yeah, it's still a stupid thing, but oh, overall his career is I think so everybody's going to have different, but that's, that's part of why you have the baseball association of America. Everybody is supposed to have these differing opinions and, and give you all the things. It shouldn't use, bunch be a be a bunch of old guys going but back in my day the players were real men and they didn't wear batting helmets they took 95 mile per hour balls off the face and kept playing 
back in my day, we were smoking weed under the bleachers, then we'd go up to bat. Back in my day, you drank a beer when you were rounding first, and you drank a beer when you were rounding second, and you drank a beer when you were rounding third. And the fourth inning was the beer inning. I know how to play play baseball, thank you. We know how to play softball. (laughs) (laughs) That is still one of the single best episodes of that show, and one of the Mm -hmm. single single best episodes in regards to uh, baseball in television history, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And just when he's talking about when he's making Wonder Bad, it's like, so I hid myself under the largest piece of sheet metal I could find and ran for a tall tree. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But yeah, we're going to get more and more Hall of Fame ballots pouring in here over the next month or so. And it's going to be really interesting to see who who ends up where um you know you've got gary sheffield in his final year on the ballot and he's probably going to gain some votes because a lot of guys gain votes in their last year on the ballot but you don't know if he's actually going to get in or not um all we can do here is we're sitting by and we're hoping that this is the year for for todd who is who is more than deserving and should have already been in he was 11 vote uh, 11 votes shy last year so you'll have new voters, first time voters this season, and then hopefully some other guys can you know, maybe be belong, especially some of those older guys like John Heyman, who said he would consider Todd Helton. He would consider him. How generous of him. I know. He's well, gonna, gonna consider and... one of the best first basemen of our generation. In the history of baseball. But Coors Field, ooh. How dare he play someplace other than New York? Or Boston. Uh, That almost happened. Let us not forget that. Man, what a weird world that would have been in. 2007, he gets traded. Prior to 2007, he gets traded to the Boston Red Sox. And we have Kevin Lowell. Lowell as our third baseman. I would have never... That would have been one of those things like I've talked about this a lot where it's like the Rockies do have an unfair reputation of trading away all their superstars when it, it generally genuinely hasn't actually happened that often. Not and, when it, trying. <laughs> and when it, and when it does, they're usually, you know, at the point where they're getting very near to retirement. So like when we traded Dante Bichette, when we traded Larry Walker, they were both in like the final few seasons of their career. But that would have been those things where if we had traded Todd Helton, I would have never forgiven the team. Yeah, yeah it would have been the weird. That's talking about it with Patrick to... going into the Rockies verse, the multiverse. Yeesh. I don't want to go to that reality. That's a bad timeline. That's a timeline that we don't want. <laughs> yeah, because the Rockies don't probably wouldn't have a World Series appearance at this point. Weird. It is weird. But Ugh. on that note, that's going to do it for us here at Affected by Altitude. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend if you celebrate that particular holiday. Skyler, where can the folks find you at? You can find me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at, at sideline underscore crowd, and writing the Wednesday rock piles, and writing all kinds of stuff over at Fans First Sports Network. Also, check out Every Rocky Ever. Don't know when the next episode's coming, but hey, check it out anyway. But it's coming. He's uh, cooking up a something. Sure. <laughs> You're not supposed to say, I have no idea when the next episode's going to be out, if there even is one. Who knows? Maybe the show's over. <laughs> we never know. Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Evan underscore Lang27 for however much longer that website's going to be around with all those advertisers jumping ship. I'm trying to be a little bit more active on threads and blue sky, uh, both at Evan Lang27 um, and then for blue sky ad.bsky.social. Um, catch me on Thursdays on Purple Row, right in the Thursday rock piles. Most recent one was our Thanksgiving list where I say, hey, there there is indeed things to be thankful for even though the season stank there are things to be thankful for for colorado rockies fans Mm -hmm. Uh, Uh, also go check out our spreadshirt thing we got a link on our 
Twitter page for our T-shirt merch. Yeah. What, uh, uh, what a great we can go in there that would be for the Rockies fan in your life. Yeah, that's baseball. Perhaps even is there a way we can put some sort of deal on that? That's Maybe. something I could probably figure out. We'll look into it. But yeah, it's even then like not they're not super they're like twenty some odd bucks. They're good nice quality shirts. shirt. Yeah, they're I good wear quality mine all shirts. The time. We get a notification if people buy one, I think. <laughs> not many, but hey, it's available. It's a good shirt. Go get it. A lot of it's a good meme. I like the that's baseball. And then, of course, uh, follow us on Twitter and YouTube here at Rocky Mountain Rooftop at Rocky Mountain Rooftop. That's at R O C K Y M T N Rooftop. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you would be so kind as to leave a review on your podcasting platform of choice, we would greatly appreciate it. And until next time, keep watching the skis. I mean, Skies. Hit him with Skyler. Farewell. Oh, God, the turkey's back. Gobble, gobble, gobble.